Well, good morning, my very fine friends. What a difference a week can make, huh? When we think that things are, couldn't get worse, they seem to keep getting worse. <laughs> Which makes our message all this, the greater importance of it. We spent last week, really the past two weeks, delving into Revelation chapter 10 to really try to give you a, an understanding, a feeling of who we are as a people, what our message is to the world. It's not an exclusive thing that Adventists can say, look, we're these people over here that's mentioned and you don't fit that description. And it's more rather, hey, we got a gift to give to you. It's an urgent message. I don't know why God chose us. Maybe for the same reason he said that he chose the Israelites, not because you were a great people, but because you were the worst. <laughs> God seems to do that. And so, just to recap last week, we looked at Revelation um, chapter 10, and we discovered that it was the great Advent message to the world, that there was this angel that came down with this book that was at one time in the book of Daniel sealed, and that those sealed prophecies all culminated in that 2,300-year prophecy. Daniel's, all of his prophecies are herding us to the 2,300-year timeline when it expires. You're in the year 1844. That takes us to Revelation 10 that opens that book, that gives us that insight that there is, there is an opening, a rediscovering of these scriptures. And when you get to Revelation 10, there is obviously some kind of obscurity there because there is these seven thunders, this voice from God that he hears, but God says, oh, don't write that down. I'm, I'm going to withhold some information. And that withholding of that information we recognize was that idea that the message would be sweet in their mouth and bitter in their belly. There would be this expectation, but this terrible disappointment about that message of Daniel's. And we've seen historically there is only one movement, one people, one message that ever claimed to be that people. And we recognize that that pointed to the rise of the Advent movement. And what is beautiful about Revelation 10 and Revelation 11, they're really one thought. Get rid of chapters. They didn't exist. So two form what we call a parenthetical in between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet when it sounds, which is a judgment, the judgment of all judgments against the world, is when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord. The seventh trumpet is over with. It's Christ coming. There's no more nothing. The sixth trumpet, our forefathers and men as far back as Martin Luther had already recognized that it had been sounded. It's been going on in the rise of the Islamic movement against the Eastern Church. And the sixth trumpet has done been sounded a long time ago. So we're waiting between the sixth and the seventh trumpet towards the end of that time period. And before the seventh trumpet can be sounded, this idea of Revelation 10 and 11, this book, this message has to be proclaimed to the world before the seventh trump can be sounded. It is the message. Usually we go to Revelation 13 and 14 and put our emphasis on, but really the true emphasis begins in Revelation 10 and Revelation chapter 11. And what I find really interesting, we didn't talk much about it last week, but that angel that comes down in verse 1 in chapter 10 I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like the pillars of fire. That is none other than Jesus himself. This message is so important that he doesn't entrust it to just any old angel or any old people or any old thing. Christ himself comes down and opens the book and says, Yeah, the prophecies of Daniel, I want you to begin to prophesy. I want you to go forward into the world. He commissioned those people in 1844 to go to the world, Christ himself. And what is beautiful, the thought to me anyway, is that here we are all these generations later, 170 plus years later, and that angel, Christ himself, still has the book open saying, eat. I still need a people to eat it to ingest it. I still need a people to go and prophesy to many nations, tongues, and peoples. And that is a privilege for us to be here to understand the importance of Revelation 10. But even more important, Revelation 11 is an even more important idea, especially in the light of the place where we are today. Revelation 11 verse 1 naturally flows out of Revelation 10 verse 11. It's the next 
thought. Go and prophesy to many people. And then Revelation 11.1 1 tells us what to be prophesied. It's a further explanation of the little book that was opened in his hand in verse 1 of chapter 10. It's taken us right back to the idea and it's going to give us rock solid proof that the message that we speak is the message of all messages. And we need to understand that today because in light of of Brother Floyd, in light of a rioting, torn world, in light of a world crying for social justice, in light of a political system that is in scandal and shambles, in light of we just barely are recovering from the idea of COVID-19 and who knows what's coming in the future. We're facing financial collapse. There's all kind of uncertainty. And there's a lot of people within this church and in other churches saying, this is the message you need to preach. Here's the message the world needs to hear. Here's what the Adventist church needs to do. And I do away with all of your opinions and your ideas. And I go to the word and says, what does the Bible tell me the message of the Seventh-day Adventist church is? It must be in Revelation 10 and 11. And it is nothing else but that. Now, there is room for all kind of ministries and ideas of helping the poor in Isaiah 58 and the oppressed and and, and taking care of people. There's room for those things, but the message is always what it's been, and it hasn't changed over time, and it will not change until the seventh trumpet sounds. This is the message. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, we're going right into our next chapter. Revelation 11, 1, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angels And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. Now, we've read that a lot of times and most of that just goes right over our head. But but John is being very specific. Anyone in the first century, any good Jew hearing what he just said would have automatically been triggered to where that came from. John's not making this up in some kind of weird esoteric go rise and measure the temple. He's quoting Ezekiel, the 40th chapter. Ezekiel 40, it's a word-for-word quote out of the book of Ezekiel. And he's telling us, if you want to know what I need my people to go and prophesy, go back and look at Ezekiel 40. Ezekiel 40, verse 1 through 3. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after that city was captured, on that very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there, In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain, and on it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. And the rest of the chapter deals with this being that's the same guy in Revelation chapter 10 saying, Go and measure the city. It's the exact idea. But you can't let Ezekiel 40 verse 1 get away from you to tell us what John is trying to subtly say. You know, the book of Revelation, John from the beginning in chapter 1 tells you is written in symbols. It's just the way God chose to do it. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, does that ring a bell? What is the beginning of the year for the Jewish holidays? The beginning of their religious year is the seventh month. The beginning of the year on the 10th day of the seventh month is what? It's the day of atonement. John is alerting us immediately to what he's already said in Revelation chapter 10, the little book that Daniel opened that was opened, that was leading us to the great antitypical day of atonement or the day of judgment. In Ezekiel, it's exactly where he is as he's being prophesied, as he's being told to rise and measure. It is on the day of atonement that God gives him that vision. It's what John is helping us to understand. In fact, the only time you see, like in John, where he says, rise and measure the altar, the temple, and the congregants, the only other place you see that is in Leviticus 16, which again is the Day of Atonement. We're getting right from the get-go this picture that those that go and prophesy to the world, they are to prophesy about this Day of Atonement that Daniel said would come at the end of this great 2300-year period which we know to understand would begin in the year 1844. So before the seventh trumpet could sound, Daniel, Ezekiel, and John in Revelation is saying, look up to the heavenly sanctuary. 
Not down on this earth where all the problems are. Not trying to solve all its political issues with who you vote for or what message you agree with or don't agree with. Get your eyes on the heavenly sanctuary. Because that is going to be how God solves the problems of the earth. Revelation chapter 11, 12, 13, 14 form what that atonement, judgment, our message is all about. Revelation 14 is just bringing it to its conclusion, but it actually begins in Revelation chapter 10. And when we look at Ezekiel, with, uh, with our, he's our precursor to what John is trying to say. So I had to read the book of Ezekiel about four times this past week to try to boil down what is the book of Ezekiel about. Before that statement in Ezekiel chapter 40, what were the first 39 chapters all about? And there's a lot of theology there, a lot of things you can preach about, but over and over and over again, there's one theme that arises out of the first 39 chapters, and it's one word, and it's judgment. God is judging everybody in those 39 chapters. He's judging his people. He's judging Jerusalem. He's judging Israel. He is judging the Egyptians, the Ammonites. He's judging the Assyrians. He's judging Satan himself. He is judging the false shepherds of God's people. Everybody is getting judged in those 39 chapters. And there's not just some general judgment, but he's judging the world in Ezekiel 39 chapters because of their sin. And he names the sins smattered throughout the 39 chapters. He says, I am judging the world because of the sin of rebellion of their impudence, of their stubbornness, of their refusal to keep my judgments and my statutes and my ways, because of their idol worship, their spiritual adultery, because their cities are filled with violence and crime, because their women are weeping for Tammuz, because their men are worshiping the sun in my sanctuary, because of the perversities of every kind of sort, because of false prophets who cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace, because you have been practicing divinization and magic, because everyone has idols and idols in their hearts because of adultery, oppression of the poor, profiting by usury and interest, refusing to give your bread to the hungry, refusing to clothe the naked, robbers and thieves, a nation that refuses to repent and turn to God, a nation that is defiled and breaks His Sabbath, a nation that is guilty of infanticide, profane in His holy name, mistreat the fatherless and widows, mock God's name, committed lewdness and incest, bribes and extortions, dishonest prophet, bloodshed, murder, Her priests have violated my law, failed to distinguish between holy and unholy, between the clean and unclean, oppressed the stranger, mistreated the poor. Immorality and lust are her ways. She lusted after the ways of the world, slain the children for their idols. Because your heart is lifted up and you say I'm a God, for they hear my words and do not do them. That is a plethora of sins. That is sins that cover the entire gamut of the world. God is judging the world because of her sins. It is an accurate description of the earth today. Nearly every sin that Ezekiel mentions in those 39 chapters are the exact same sins, but on steroids today. And then when you get to Ezekiel 40, think about this. I'm going to judge the world because of the sins of the world. And then you get to Ezekiel 40 and God says, Ezekiel, measure the temple. And the next eight chapters, which are the last chapters of Ezekiel, is nothing but the measuring of the temple. He tells him, you go and you get a measure, something like a reed and a rod, and you measure every facet of the temple. It's interesting. It would be like today because we know that the temple was really a symbol in the Old Testament of the plan of salvation. Every piece of furniture, every drapery every carpet every color every piece of metal every stand it all pointed for in some way to the work of the messiah and how god was going to deal with sin it would be like me saying okay i want y'all to measure if everything in this place was a symbol of jesus i want y'all to measure the pulpit the flowers this thing here the piano i want you to measure the, the lights and the little cubicles and the electrical sockets and the carpet Measure everything. What do you think that God is telling Ezekiel to really actually look at? Because the world is being judged for their sin, because the hour of judgment is coming, God wants Ezekiel to measure every aspect of the plan of salvation, to look and to understand that God has a plan to deal with our sin and the judgment. 
In fact, when you get to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, he was given the task to measure, and it says 27 times in those eight chapters, and he measured, he measured, he measured, he measured. In other words, he is looking at the gospel. He is looking in the holy sanctuary, in the heavenly city, and he's looking at how God is going to deal with the problems of man's sin. And he's going to deal with that particularly on the Day of Atonement in a specific fashion and way. And that is why John, looking at the end of time, when the world is just torn all apart, how is God going to deal with the sin of the world? As the Day of Atonement approaches its end, We look to the heavenly sanctuary, specifically in the Day of Atonement, and there is a picture of how God will deal with your sin, my sin, and the man that caused riots all over the world. He's going to deal with it in his particular way. And when you measure, when you look, And here is the beautiful thing of of Ezekiel. As you're measuring and as you're looking, as you're looking at how God's going to deal with sin, as you're peering into the sanctuary, something is supposed to happen to you, to me, and to the world. It's said in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 10, as he's measuring and measuring and looking and looking and tabulating and figuring, he comes to its conclusion with some nice words, son of man. Describe the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. Looking into the heavenly sanctuary, measuring the pattern was intended to bring us to repentance, to bring us to conviction. Now, I know that seems fair to ask of us here today, but what of the world who could care less about God? who could care less about religion. But the message to them is still the same to us. We are all locked in this thing together. We are all a world full of sin. And the message is look to the sanctuary and find conviction and repentance of your sins. And tell them to measure the pattern. There couldn't be more relevant of a message today to tell the world to measure the pattern Because it's something that we just seem to not get. In other words, when you look at the man that killed George Floyd, when you look at the people rioting and tearing stuff down and burning the city to the ground, when you look to the foul politicians, liberal and conservative, they all stink to the high heavens. When you look at the sin and tragedy of the world, it's not just the world, but it's us. We're part of it. It's not them and you and us. It's us. This is the human nature. We're all part of this broken, foul system that we seem not to get. And the reason God wants us to look to the heavenly sanctuary to to measure the pattern and to come under condemnation and come under conviction is for a purpose. It's so that He can do probably what is best said What Ezekiel does in chapter 16, Ezekiel in chapter 16 tells a parable really of his entire idea that we're talking about. He tells the story about the world through a woman. In Ezekiel chapter 16, she is condemned and there is this just two chapter list of sin after sin after sin after sin. But he gets to the punchline in verse 63 of chapter 16. That you may remember and be ashamed and nevermore open your mouth because of your shame when I provide an atonement for all you have done. That is the idea what God is after. He is trying to drive the world so, to conviction so that he can provide the atonement for their sin. He's trying to get them to get to the place where they confess, they repent, and they say, yes, I, I am just like everyone else in this world, a wreck. I'm a mess. And it's what John is trying to help us understand in a Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. The message is of the sanctuary. The message is the world needs to come under conviction because God is seeking to finish the judgment and bring us to an atonement. And you cannot come to that atonement until you first come to repentance. And social justice is never going to bring us to repentance. You can force people. We can make laws. We can lobby, we can riot, we can demand, we can be angry, we can yell, we can scream, we can be appalled, but the only hope for the world is this message in these two chapters in Revelation. 
It's said best in this commentary on Ezekiel 40 as it relates to Revelation 11. Listen to this. The grand judgment has taken place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshipers thereof. Remember when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When you are attending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, God is measuring you. Remember that your words and actions are being daguerreotyped, photographed in the books of heaven as the face is reproduced on the artist, on the polished plate. Have you, dear youth, your lamps trimmed and burning? The work is going on in the heavenly court. In vision on the Isle of Patmos, John said, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Arise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. This solemn work is to be done upon the earth. Look and see how stands your measurement of character as compared with God's standard of righteousness, his holy law. The worshipers are to pass under the measuring line of God. We're to pass under that measure and line of God. And we could take that out of Victorian a, uh, language and put it into today's. We could say, God is measuring you on Facebook. He's measuring your words, your tweets, what you share, what you say, what you think, what you do in the dark. God is measuring us. But his intention is to drive me into repentance. His intention is to get me to ask the questions that I don't want to ask. Now, we can't leave out this idea, what are we measuring? What is the pattern that we're to measure to? There is a, there is a nomenclature that is not a coincidence in scriptures. Revelation 11, verse 1, right? It says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. There is no coincidence that in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, we get a view of what this rod of God is that Ezekiel is being told to measure everything by and that John is using to measure everything by. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The rod that everything is to be measured by in the temple is Jesus. He is the rod. He is the pattern that the temple is screaming to the world to look at. And when we look at the pattern enough, rightly so, we will come under conviction. We will see our faults and our deficiencies. He is the standard where everything was measured by. In the Old Testament, it shadowed and pointed forward to Him we are to diligently look at the rod, look at the pattern, compare the Gospels, look at the way he talked and loved and treated and acted. Even in times like today, when the world is outraged over what happened in Minneapolis, we are to look to the pattern, not to people's frustrations. We are to measure things by the rod. And I will see my deficiencies clear. And I will know what I am to repent of. I am to know what to get what sins into the sanctuary. This is where we're missing everything. Somehow that just continues to go over our head. I could, if I could tell you of 20 years as a pastor and another 15 years as a lay Bible worker. This is the one thing that seems to be so hard for us to grasp is that we look at the pattern, but we really are not peering into the pattern. And I know that we're not looking at the pattern because we continue to have problems with hypocrisy and negativity and criticism and backbiting and gossip. Those subtle little things that we can justify because, hey, I'm just telling the truth or I'm just alerting you. or I'm just telling you something. We have these subtle little characteristics that are so unlike Christ. It's incredible that we can't see them. And I'm talking about me. And we're just so used to this foul way of living that we look at the life of Christ and go, oh yeah, that was just Jesus. Yep, He was the perfect Lamb of God. But we were intended to measure our life to Him and then say, oh man, Lord, I repent of my mouth, my negativity, my criticism, my hypocrisy, my gossiping, my backbiting, my negativity, how I tear people down. I repent. I am sorry, God, how I treat my wife, what I say to my neighbor, what I tweet on Facebook. I am sorry, Lord. 
that is what measuring my life up against the standard is. Yes, it's the gross things too. Maybe you're a liar or a thief. Maybe you're a fornicator. Maybe you're an adulterer. I don't know where you are. Those are the big things, but it's the little things that's going to get us in the judgment. It is His responsibility, know this, to bring you to conviction. Your job is to get the sin to the sanctuary. That's a pretty easy thing to do. Paul was the master measurer. You know what, man? There was nobody like Paul. There was no one that had that kind of open honesty. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. He was not unclear about this pattern business. Ephesians 4, verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That was ever Paul's standard. He's always looking to the pattern, looking into the gospel, studying his life, the Sermon on the Mount, how he dealt with the people that hated him, what he cried out from Calvary's cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they would do. He was always measuring his life to that, and he came to the truth about himself in Romans chapter 7. The truth about who he was, Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Paul understood it, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul understood it. As he measured himself to Christ, he could not bear to look at himself. But all that he knew to do was to cry out, because Lord, I need your covering. I need your righteousness, your goodness, because mine is being exposed and I'm afraid that it's not going to get me through. And because of this grotesque reality of our sinful nature, what we see and what we do not see, we need to be saved from condemnation that the law brings that condemns me, Damon Sneed, rightly so, to death. The law condemns me to death. And because of this, the angel said, look to the day of atonement. Because you're condemned and the world is condemned. They're condemned. And because of that condemnation, because of the honesty, as as the world begins to look to Christ and feel the conviction, the angel in Revelation 11 says, you go prophesy, verse 10, chapter 10, you go prophesy to the world, prophesy what? prophesy get your mind i got a group of people they're going to be talking about the sanctuary and what goes on there listen to that message that's revelation 11 and because of that hebrews would would just oh so beautifully look in rapid fire succession let me go through these texts quickly because we have a message in the sanctuary hebrews just comes right in there and says this is what the reality is hebrews 6 verse 20 where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become our high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7, verse 24 and 26, it continues, But he, because he continues forever as an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. 8, chapter 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man in 924 couldn't be clear. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. That is Revelation 10, verse 11 and 11, verse 1. That is the message of Ezekiel 40, the message of Daniel 8, 14. That is the little book that is open to the world. We have a high priest that is passed into the heavens that needs you to be convicted and repent and get your sins into the sanctuary while the doors are still open. And we can talk and cry out about all kinds of things. But this is the message. And we have rock-solid biblical foundation to prove ourselves as Adventists. We have much more than the seventh-day Sabbath, I promise you. This is our message. Now, John was told in Revelation 11, verse 1, in case we missed the first clause, 
in case Ezekiel 40 gets past you, in case that date there and you don't get it, you should really get this. And the angel said, rise and measure the temple of God. The temple of God. The word that they use for temple is naos. And it refers to only one thing. Go and rise and measure the holy of holies. Go measure the most holy place. We understand that measuring is looking into the plan of salvation. God is telling John, you go tell the world. Those people that are going to go prophesy. You go tell them to go measure the most holy place. Look at the plan of salvation as it is revealed in the most holy place. Adventists have been criticized for what people call an odd, at least weird, maybe religion because of this sanctuary message, but it is the message. There's nothing else here. There's room for Isaiah 58. I get it. There's room for the ministry of healing and setting the oppressed free. There's room for that in all that we do, but the message is clear what we should be sounding today in a world that's in turmoil. And this is what thrilled the early Adventist church. This is what they were so in love with. Was that Christ, our high priest, has passed into the naos, into the holy of holies. And he's there, according to Hebrews, doing this work of intercession, of causing you through the Holy Spirit to repent and be convicted and take your sin, whatever sin, all sin. There's no reason not one remain on us. Not one We bring it to him. Conviction comes and we bring it to him. That's the purpose. That's the process that's going on. The only person that's in danger is the one that holds on. And says, ah, you can have all of them but this one. Remember when we did the cups up here? We talked about the cups and God's all these things. God's not really interested maybe in this and this. He's interested in, in this particular one. He's interested in this attitude. He's interested in, in the way that you treat somebody. The feelings that you have, the thoughts, the intents of your heart. He is after that kind of stuff. And he's got to get down there and he's got to reveal it to you. The danger is that we just don't want that. We hide behind all. At least I do. I like to hide behind all the good that I do. But the one thing that I don't want him to mess with, that's the thing that he's after. That's the thing that can send me being cut off forever out of the sanctuary. God has promised if you repent... And we've done many lectures on repentance. Repentance is this willful acknowledgement of what you said is right. And I choose, Lord, with my own whole heart to turn away from it with your help of the Holy Spirit. You help me. And God's saying, I can forgive that. I can, be co- I can cover you. And it's no matter what, any sin that you have ever committed, the most grotesque that you can imagine, murder, abortion, homosexuality, pedophilia, abusers, tyrants, it doesn't matter what. He says, just bring them all. Yeah, I know that's, ooh, that's nasty. Yes, yeah, so is that too. Come on, come on, come on. It's interesting why they sprinkled blood in the Old Testament. You got to get this. This is like one of those coolest studies. I wish we could just flush this out. Why did they sprinkle blood? You know that when they brought their sin in the Old Testament to the animal, it transferred from them. They confessed it on the head of the lamb. And it, and it literally, God looked at it and it's leaving them to this animal. And then it would go from the animal as it was slaughtered. The blood would be collected in the bowl and, and poured out at a basin. It was to then leave the animal to the altar. And then at the end of the day, they would have this ceremony where they would take the blood. And they would do it at other times too, but it just in general, get the idea. That they would take the blood and they would go sprinkle it on the veil of the most holy place. Of the ho- it was on the cis side of the holy place, not on the other side. But you know what I'm saying. They would sprinkle these little droplets of blood. And I've always wondered... Well, why didn't God just say, okay, you're forgiven? Why the blood? Why sprinkle the droplets of blood? Most Hebrew scholars recognize that these little carmine drops of blood, these scarlet little drops of blood, were records of your sin. They were miniature records, like little tiny uh, nanobites on your flash drive. That, That sin that was confessed was recorded on that little, little drop of blood, and it was sprinkled on the veil, and that had... Huge implications in a courtroom setting. Because when you came up in the judgment, when your name was brought up, Curtis Damon Sneed, where was my sin? It wasn't on me. It was in the right place. It was on the veil of the temple. It was apart from me. So when the accuser of the brother came, if you read this story in the third chapter of Zechariah, when the accuser of the brother comes, there's no sin on me. It's on the veil. And what does Hebrews 10 verse 20 say the veil is? The veil was a symbol of the flesh of Christ. 
And so when I confess my sin, the little droplets of blood, the record of my sin is in the right place. It goes to the flesh of Christ. It's away from me. So in the judgment, when I'm standing there before God with my name coming up in the records, my sin, all of my sin is got to be in the right place. And again, it is not your job to just dig down and make sure you get everything. That's his job to dig down and make sure you know of everything. To acknowledge, to confess, and to repent is what the Day of Atonement was really all about. It was about, therefore, then being sealed because you repented. God could seal you because there was no sin on you. Repentance was the name of the game. But God knows it's a difficult thing for us to see our sin. It's not an easy thing to do. So God told John not only measure the temple, but to measure the altar. Now, we assume with some good accuracy that this was not the altar of the burnt offering in the courtyard in the outside because it says leave that out. That could be another whole great Bible study, why that was left out, but that's for another day. So the only other altar was the golden altar of incense in the holy place. And in measuring the golden altar of incense, you had to take into account the candelabra and the table of showbread. So in order to help us to get to this level of repentance, to get to the most holy place, you've got to go through the holy place. You've got to get to the altar of incense and measure it. Now, all of the Old Testament, the altar of incense clearly represented, do you remember? What ascended up before God and the incense, it was burning 24-7, the prayers of people. Mingled with the blood of the sacrifice, because of the sacrifice, because of the blood, the prayers could then mingle together with the blood and were acceptable to God. So prayer becomes this important component if I want to have a true understanding of what I am. If I want to get all my sin into the sanctuary before that door closes, I must have a life meaningful with prayer. I must be coming to God like David did in Psalm 139. Test me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. And Lord, know my anxieties and then lead me in the way of everlasting. We've got to have that attitude of prayer like, God, I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. I got one way of looking at things. I'm often wrong. Please come into my heart and show me. That's what prayer will do. And God will show up. Because we're all messed up in some way that we cannot see. I can see Mary clearly. (laughs) But I can't see my own self most of the time. We need that constant idea of prayer. The candelabra, we've got to m- measure the candelabra. The candelabra was the light of the sanctuary, actually. It lit up everything. And it lit up from a certain source. Do you remember the source? It was filled full of oil. Oil was always a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lit it up in Jesus when he said, I am the, the light of the world, but he was filled with the oil of the world. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and because of that, he was, he was able to light the world up. Paul makes it clear, if we're ever going to be honest with God in these closing days of earth's history, if we're ever going to be honest about what I need to repent of, I need to be filled with the oil of that candelabra. I need to measure it and understand it. Ephesians 5, verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Oh, man, be filled with the Spirit. You know how wine makes you feel? Just a little glass. I know, look, I, I got Italian backgrounds, and, and I know what a good, a good glass of rosé does. It just smells so good, and it goes down smooth, and you gives that little warm feeling all over. You drink a couple of more, and you start to feel this strangeness to be filled with the Holy Spirit, man, as Paul is saying, is, is to receive this warmth, this light that comes from God. Not like alcohol, which is a cheap knockoff. But to have your mind altered in a different way. To have your mind so infused with God's Spirit that you think and act differently like alcohol does to you. Instead of acting like a fool, you're acting like Christ. If you want to be true and honest about what the Holy Spirit can do, where He can lead you to this repentance, you've got to be a life of prayer. and You've got to be filled with the Spirit. But there's one more thing in that that holy place that needed to be measured, and that was the table of showbread in you. This is like the easy one. Remember, actually, if you want to find out where else um, God tells someone to eat the word, it's in Ezekiel too. It's not just John, but in the book of Ezekiel and Daniel, 
they're like this really neat thing God tells Ezekiel to take my words and eat them. And Jesus said that all the time, you, sh- you eat me, take my word, I am the bread of life, to take him, to ingest him in. Matthew 4, verse 4 says, the man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If we want to be, have an honest opinion about what I am, so that I can repent, so that I can get every foul sin that needs to be out of me into that sanctuary, I need to be feeding on that word, because it is going to tell you about the life of Christ. Every story, every parable, every psalm, every proverb, it is all about Christ. Genesis all the way to Revelation. The Gospels are are more pointed and specific, and and the epistles to the churches, they they really get in there and pinpoint. And Revelation is obscure with all these symbols, but it's all telling me of Jesus. And if I eat it and I look at this pattern, man, I will come under conviction sooner or later. I will come under conviction. And even in these hard times where people are saying, yeah, but you're always doing that as Christians, taking the high road, saying, let's be like Jesus. We're not going to be like Jesus right now. We're going to be angry and upset and violent. But you can't do that. Because that anger and that upset, even in extreme situations, whether it's what we're going through today in the world or what you're going through in your family, in your marriage, in your relationships, those extreme situations are meant to bring out the very fact of your sin so that you can repent of it and turn it loose. So when you yell at your wife or you get mad at your boss or you catch yourself in some corner gossiping or saying something that you probably shouldn't, when you catch yourself, like so many times in my life, I I catch myself tearing somebody down and realizing the Bible says bear one another's burdens. Lift them up, build them up. They don't need no more tearing down. They got enough of that going on. When I realize that I'm doing that, God, forgive me. Get that sin into the sanctuary. Get it away from me. Get those little blood droplets on the veil because that's where they need to be. By these things and to the degree that we indulge him is truly how we'll be measured by the rod and if you'll be free or not. But there's one more thing that John says in our story before we close Revelation 11 out. There's one more thing that needed to be measured. We've kind of been talking about it, but more specifically, it says, measure those that worship there. That is very specific. Because so far, we've been talking about what it means to be justified by faith in Christ's righteousness. Through faith, by grace, we are saved in what he has done. But this last little clause is going to take us in another direction that we cannot leave out in the gospel story. Best in this commentary, once again, summing up this, this idea, this last sentence This church is to be a temple built after the divine similitude. And the angelic architect has brought his golden measuring rod from heaven that every stone may be hewed and squared by the divine measurement and polished to shine as an emblem of heaven, radiating in all directions the bright, clear beams of the sons of righteousness. The dross, the worthless material will be consumed and the influence of the truth testifies to the world of its sanctifying, ennobling character. So if I'm saved by faith, if I've received the righteousness of Christ imputed to me, if by faith I know that I am free in that judgment, then the Spirit floods into me and begets a new life. The works have to match the faith. James is clear about this. Without it, you're dead. Acts 2, verse 38. Another wonderful text. Peter is absolutely simple with this. Acts 2, verse 38, they said, after listening to the gospel, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. And let everyone of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, that's sanctific- justification, and then look at this, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have to receive the Spirit. There has to be a sanctified influence in your life. Paul would say it this way in Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Romans 6, Now, after having been set free from sin and having become slaves to God, verse 22, you have your fruit to holiness. That's the same word for sanctification. After becoming a slave to God, after being justified by faith, after being put to death in the baptismal tank, when you come up, your fruit is must be to holiness there must be a change transform life this is the the idea of measure those in the temple here's their profession of faith but are they being squared are they being measured are they being polished are they letting god change and transform them is there transformation in their life the same person that same wife that they've been fighting with their whole life have they stopped yet (laughs) 
Are you still doing it after 50 years? Either God is wrong or you just not facing it. First Peter, I'm not going to read this text, but it should be on your screen. First Peter says that we are a royal priesthood. We are, we are a building being fitted for the kingdom of heaven. So yes, I am saved by faith in the grace that God gives me. I am justified by faith. His righteousness is imputed to me when I repent, when I'm baptized, when I ask for forgiveness, but I must be transformed and changed. This is the message of the sanctuary. This is what it means to measure, to be measured by the rod, to measure the temple, to measure the altar, and you yourself be measured. It is the complete picture of justification and sanctification. And brother and sister, there is nothing that can measure us like the law of God. This is why Revelation 14, 12, which ends the judgment hour message. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It is everywhere. Revelation 12, 17, the devil is wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 22, here are they that have the right to the tree of life that they keep the commandments of God. In, all through the book of Matthew, John, the Gospels, if you love me, keep my commandments. Commandment keeping, the law is the standard, the righteousness that we look to that condemns, convicts, and then tells us you need a Savior. But the world has done away with the law of God. Adventists, in part of their message in Revelation 10 11, is to bring back focus to the world, God's law, how it works together with the gospel. And we're not ashamed of it. And we're not ashamed to say that the Sabbath is part of the law of God. If you haven't watched the lecture that we did here on YouTube called Bare Naked, it's all about how deep the law goes. It's not just what's written in the letter on stone, the Ten Commandments. But it's what's in the mind, you remember? And then it's not just what's in the mind, your thoughts, but it's what's in your heart. And at its core, at its depth, it is the character of Christ revealed in the Gospels. That is to measure me. That is to bring me to conviction. That is to show me that you need to get to the sanctuary. Ninth, Psalm 19, verse 7, for the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It is that text. The law always works together with the gospel. At the end of time, in the judgment hour message, Revelation 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, is saying, I'm going to have a people that unseal this book of Daniel that talks about Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, that the judgment has begun, and they're going to bring back together to the world the law and the gospel, how they work together to bring my people to repentance so that I can cleanse them, forgive them, fill them with my spirit, and transform them. That is how he makes the world ready for the second coming. The judgment hour is calling us to be measured as, as precisely as Ezekiel chapter 40 was measuring the sanctuary. You measure every aspect of your, of your life. What comes out of your lips, every joke that you laugh at, what angers me, the thoughts and intents of my hearts, my motivations. But I struggle and you struggle. Right? It's like... You know, when you're asked to look at yourself, you, you know, you get these stupid, I hate these 3D pictures that they say, put your nose on and then slowly pull it away and you'll see it. I do that till I'm cross-eyed. I won't blink. My eyes are watering. I can't see the image. And I do it and I look and I look and then finally after what seems like hours, I'm like, oh, I see something emerge. It just pull, it just comes out of there. You're like, oh, that is so cool. That is how we have to measure ourselves. We have to look that deeply, that intently. We have to keep looking and looking at Christ, looking at Christ, looking at Christ, looking, looking until that image comes up. And in my own mind and heart, I say, oh, man, oh, man, oh, God, forgive me. And do it long enough. And we're a day of atonement people, right? We're living in the time of the atonement, the judgment hour message, and the people living in the day of atonement in the Old Testament were continually in sackcloth, fasting, and ashes. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12 says this. It's a paraphrase of our greatest problem. Of course, we wouldn't dare to put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves with those so highly they compare themselves to one another and make up their own standards to measure themselves by, and then they judge themselves by their own standards. What self-delusion. 
that is what we're all up against. We're all deluded by self. We create our own standards, our own justifications. The judgment hour message to the world is to me, and it says, Damon, you need to repent. You need to let me get down in there and dig up and bring up and get it to the sanctuary. I'll cover you. I'll transform you. I'll change you. I'll send my spirit. You don't worry about that. You just keep repenting and looking, repenting and looking, and the transformation will take place. Those of us that were baptized, and those that's going to be baptized, This is the message, man. This is how it happens. We let Christ plunge us into those waters. Some of you are teeter-tottering. Some of you have never been baptized, and that's a terrible shame, for unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And we're living in a time where that's playing around with fire, I think, right? You haven't even begun the process. If you haven't been baptized, you haven't even begun to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're just, it's just on the outside saying, hey, you need to take this serious. You can't even enter into the kingdom of Christ. You're not even in Christ if you're not baptized. That's why Paul said, hey man, don't fool around. Get into the tank and come up and get into the Spirit and let the process begin. The process of repentance can't even begin until you've made that commitment to follow Christ in baptism. So please, and if you were baptized at 10 years old and didn't have a clue of what you was doing, maybe it's not a bad idea to be rebaptized because now you do know what you're doing. My appeal is simple. Revelation in 10 and 11 is Adventist gold. It is, uh, and I say this this with shame of face, but it is our message. It identifies a group of people at the end of time that the world will listen to one day. I know we try to attract them with our beasts in Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and we try to attract them with our Sabbath and and our health message, and that's all good, but this, this should tell the world but they need to listen to what you got to say. And we need to learn it for ourselves. We need to return because God is looking for a people that are going to prophesy again. And this is the whole point of the house group meetings. Whatever may have been misunderstood about what I was saying last, group, last week. We are starting house groups for the purpose of reaching our neighbors. For the purpose of reaching people that won't come here. We're going to bring that message of prophecy to them in our homes, and if, you're, if you are unclear about what that is, please get a hold of me tomorrow at 11. We're going to do our second, we're going to do a training session for our house groups. Um, we're, gonna, we're putting together a master list. I need your information, and um, we're going to start meeting in our homes. We're going to be probably uh, the different dates and stuff that I've already preliminary been getting in. There's going to be someone meeting in someone's home almost every day of the week. And through that, we are going to prophesy again. We're going to prophesy. We're going to tell them, get up into the sanctuary. Get your sins there. Get covered. Here's the law. Here's the gospel. Here's the Sabbath. Here's Daniel. Here's Revelation. You do with it what you want. We are going to bring this message to the world outside these church doors and inside the church doors. We will again have evangelism here. But until then, we're going to do it out there because there's going to be a day where we can't do it in here. We're going to have to be doing it out there. So let's get started. That's all I was trying to say last week. So let's prophesy again as God's people and have that kind of humble pride about what God has called us to do, that Jesus himself has that book open saying, you must prophesy again. Let's have closing prayer together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, with all our living heart, And all our soul, every fiber of our being knows that what has been said is true. And we desire to be a people that prophesy again. We want to be a people that prophesy about the rod of God in Jesus Christ. We want to be a people that calls the world to measure the temple, the altar, and themselves. We want to give them a message of salvation of justification, sanctification, of being saved from sin and claimed from it. God, help us as we begin to, as a church, somehow regather and, and come together again and, and put forth a plan to reach the world through our homes. We ask for your, for your help humbly, Lord. We pray for your spirit. We ask that you would give us no rest 
until we submit to you and those that are considering baptism. God, I pray with a mighty hand you would be upon them to convict them that they could also join us, Lord. We thank you for those that were baptized today. We ask that you would honor them in a special way this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.